Um, okay, right, so uh, let me get cracking then, because um, we've got uh, three talks to get through in this session, and I, I promised Johan it would be as quick as possible to make sure we get through them. Uh, so, uh, hi, my name's uh, Paul Adams. I am the lead for open source at Zalando. Um, a little bit later on, we'll get into what that kind of means in practice, but uh, in short, um, I run a team inside Zalando that um, develops the company's strategy around open source and inner source and then coaches the wider organization um, on that strategy and the safe implementation and making sure that we meaningfully um, benefit from that, uh, uh, from that strategy. Um, before I get into Zalando, I, I would never normally talk too much about Zalando. Um, most people in Europe kind of know roughly what we do and um, at kind of what kind of scale, but for the purposes of this talk, the scale is actually kind of important, so I'm going to get to that. But before I do, just a quick question for the room. What's the hardest problem in software engineering? Anyone? Naming. Sorry? Naming. Straight in, straight in with it. Naming things, right? Uh, um, working with people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, yeah. yeah. So um, uh, actually, naming was what I was hoping someone was going to shout out. Um, ultimately, I'm, I'm telling you now what the punchline to this talk is. Um, the punchline really is that um, when, you, when, you, when you get naming wrong, you really can affect how your product is perceived and how it is used, and you end up with some distinctly suboptimal results. And I'm, I'm going to posit that pull request is a great example of that. Um, um, another good problem is, is growth, and, and the problems caused by growth uh, and what organizations have to go through when they grow is really kind of like my starting position for this, um, this whole short talk. Even better when it allows me to advance the slides. So um, I'm going to start by talking a little bit about community. Um, I'm going to talk about community um, inside um, my organization, which might seem like a funny concept because it's a company and maybe the idea of community inside a company might seem like a strange thing. Um, I will then go on to really talk about what is a pull request? Um, how do we actually use them? What do we see them as? Um, and then ultimately I'm going to take us down this little journey towards um, what I actually think they are useful for and what we should be or how we should be benefiting from this particular feature. Um, uh, the thing I'll say at this point, um, uh, because uh, Zalando is a very big GitHub user and because of course you know, GitHub has now become the sort of central focus for lots of uh, open source projects, everything I'm going to talk about in the next sort of 15, 18 minutes is very GitHub um, centric. But actually, um, if you're a user of review board or anything similar to that, the same concepts apply. Um, the only thing that's different is the terminology. So, you know, how do you go about starting a company? How do you go about starting a, a tech company, right? You have your, um, you have your founders, and the, the founders put together some really crappy product, right? Um, um, Zalando's crappy product, for those of you who don't know. Um, Zalando sold flip-flops online to people who lived in Berlin, right? Uh, this is like really restrictive product. Uh, but apparently, the founders had a good idea, and apparently it turns out the people of Berlin really like buying flip-flops. So if you're the first to market flip-flop seller, um, then who knows where you, can, uh, where you can go from there. And typically where you go is you go from your team of founders making a crappy product to then hiring your first true expert engineers who then build a better version of that product, who then expand the, the, you know, the range of functionality of that product and your founding team becomes two teams, becomes three teams, and if your product becomes hyper successful, becomes, well, kind of like this size. Um, so um, uh, Zalando by now is, it makes about four and a half billion euros a year. Um, it has 15,000 employees. Um, it's not even a team anymore. At some point when you keep adding teams and you become a team of teams and then you become a team of team of teams, there comes this point where it's like, you're not any kind of team anymore. You are a community um, and you therefore have to kind of act like a community and treat your internal community differently than you did before. I mean, organizations get, um, very large. This is something they have to learn how to do. How do I stop treating this thing like a team and, and more like a more like a community? 
Um, normally, uh, like I said, I normally avoid presenting this kind of information because for most conferences it's, it's, it's not useful stuff, but for the context of this talk it's important. And the other thing I want to follow up with now is just quickly talk about, so of those 15,000, 2,000 are tech. Um, so this is engineers, product specialism, UX, scrum masters, whatever. Anything that goes into actually building the technical product, it's about 2,000 people. Um, more importantly for this talk, that really means about 200 teams. Um, I think it's more like 230. Um, about, uh, it was like 2015, when you get to this kind of size and we're continuing to grow, you start asking yourself questions about how do I coordinate all of this? How do I create this sense of community? How do I give these 2,000 people, forget the 15,000, let's just focus on the 2,000. How do we give them a sense of shared purpose and vision, which is kind of key to having a community? And then how do I just enable them to, to just you know, get on with it, right? Because of course you can't, when you get to this size, you know, there's no home for micromanagement anymore, right? Um, you just have to enable these teams to, to uh, get on with these, uh, with that work. Um, who here, uh, who here has heard of uh, Dan Pink's book called Drive? Has anyone heard of, who's here of Dan Pink or one in the back, right? So uh, there's this, I think he's an economist. Um, he's certainly by his writings, he's definitely a, an expert on how to motivate teams. So uh, this guy called Dan Pink wrote this book called, uh, called Drive. And drive is all about how do you motivate teams of knowledge workers to achieve greatness, basically. Um, and um, the, the sort of central pillars of that text were around um, uh, mastery, so really enabling teams to do the best they can by training them, giving them plenty of headspace and time to train themselves and improve their practices and so on. Um, purpose. Every team should have a very clearly defined product vision, right? They, that team builds a thing or that team builds a set of things and that is their purpose in the wider organization. Um, and then the final one is autonomy, which is the one that's normally misunderstood and I'm going to posit this is the line that's going to get me fired. Um, I'm pretty sure autonomy was the thing that Zalando got wrong and continues to somewhat get wrong. Because autonomy is this notion of you know, my team is its master of its own destiny, right? I own my, I own my product that I build, um, and then the other teams can take it or leave it, right? And it kind of creates an um, internal market. So I can tell you now, you know, in, inside Zalando, there are teams that have shockingly similar products, right? But, they, but even internally, we have our own customers, and that team serves those customers, and that team serves those customers. It's just a natural consequence of allowing teams to have this sense of um, uh, autonomy. Um, but this is great in environments where you really care about agility, where um, you're microservice-based, right? So this concept of I really own just this little thing. Um, it works well in other forms of service-oriented architecture as well, to a certain extent. Uh, but definitely if you're very much DevOps microservices, I own my little product and it's part of a bigger picture. This kind of model works really great, but it is missing something. And this is what I'm going to get to. So, what is a PR? Someone, what's a pull request? Uh, a way to uh, propose a change and get it reviewed by your peers. Yeah, okay. M mechanism for proposing a change. Anyone, anyone got anything else? And glorified patch. It's a glorified patch. <laughs> 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 He's not wrong. Um, uh, anything else? Uh, back there. Yeah, it's a method for a to contribute to something bigger than Okay, method of contribution where someone can give up to something that's bigger than themselves. This is all kind of headed in the right direction. Um, we should probably ask GitHub um, what is a pull request. So um, this is what GitHub has to say on the matter. Uh, what do they say? They say it's a pull request that you tell others about changes you've pushed to a GitHub repository. Um, does anyone want to disagree with this since it came from the horse's mouth? All right, so this is what GitHub say. Um, I think there's some problems with this as a definition of a pull request, and this really 
comes to the, the heart of what I want to get to here. Um, so the first thing is, it's after the fact, right? Um, I am pushing a change that I have already made, right? This is, this is the central cock-up, right? This is like, I go off and I just do something unilaterally and then I tell everyone that I have done it, right? Very after the fact, which is not great. Uh, the next word they use is let. Um, let is weak, right? It's like, you know, you know, ooh, the project has allowed me to do this. How very nice of the project to allow me to contribute. Um, it doesn't really inspire contribution, right? It's just like, you know, contribute, don't contribute. Who cares, right? It's not very enthusiastic, right? It doesn't, it doesn't really in, like, make people want to use this mechanism. Um, and then the final thing is others. Who are the others? Who am I telling when I do this? Um, um, you know, you know, GitHub as a tool has its problems because, of course, it basically brings centralization back to um, to what is otherwise distributed version control. Um, but if you imagine other mechanisms where you're really using Git properly and you have lots of remotes and you're pushing stuff all over the place, um, this concept this concept of who are the others, right? Um, who who am I actually communicating this message to? So uh, you know, it's not wrong, but I think we can do better. Um, Here's my suggestion. It's an asynchronous form of communication designed to collect all information related to the development of a specific feature. Is it better? Who doesn't think it's better? Get out. <laughs> get out, get out. <laughs> um, this is just something I spitballed, right? Um, um, I could I can, I can even myself come up with reasons why it's not great, um, but I think overall, I prefer this um, because it encapsulates all sorts of stuff. Most importantly, that this is a form of communication, and it's an asynchronous form of communication, which is, that is actually an important thing to acknowledge, and I'll get to a reason why in a moment. So, let's take a look at some pull requests. So in, in my spare time, what little spare time I have, I contribute to a project called Habitat by Chef. Um, so here's an example of someone contributing to, uh, to Habitat by Chef. Um, RabbitMQ, update RabbitMQ to 371 and airline to 20. What do we score this out of 10 as a pull request? One. One. Why is it only a one? And there's no why in there, right? Right. Because who knows why they did this? Maybe, maybe this is a security update and actually super important that this gets merged, right? Maybe it's not. Um, why did they do it? Does this enable some other feature that's elsewhere, right? Maybe there's somewhere there is an issue that says that effectively they have to do this as a prerequisite to implementing that feature, right? There's no motivation here. We have absolutely no reason. We don't know why this was done, right? It just was. Um, who would merge this? If you, if you actually had the right, would you merge this? Who would merge this? You haven't even read the commits. <laughs> All right. So, so here's the thing, right? So you might be able to you might be able to discern more from from the commits, right? But now you're you're now putting more effort on the maintainer, right? Um, maintainers tend to be poor in time. Um, uh, so yes, you are actually perfectly correct. You could go and delve into the commits, but um, you have a mechanism for making life easy for the maintainer, and here it's just not being used, right? So now you're forcing the maintainer to go into the individual commits to see what was actually happening there. Um, what's the probability if I go and look at the commits that even the commit messages are meaningful given what was put in the pull request? Are there any maintainers out here? Who's a project maintainer out here? Um, I, I personally have found there's a pretty deep correlation between crappy pull requests and crappy commit messages. Um, so um, yeah, what are you going to do with this? There's, there's, there's not much information to go on here. Um, here's a different one. All right, so. Um, uh, this is my friend Howdy. We used to work together at CreateDB, so what does he say here? This implements um, issue 2200. Hi there. This PR adds basic support for Crate as a database backend to MetaBase. We know that certain tests fail, etc., but we open the PR to start the discussion of what is still to do and how we can overcome certain problems we're facing during implementation of the driver. Let's get this thing done. And then there's even a little to-do box um, where you've got to sign, you show that you've signed the contributor license agreement. So this is even like a templated PR. Um, what do we give this out of 10? Eight. Yeah, it's an eight, and it's not perfect. I mean, nothing ever is, but this is a solid seven, maybe even eight if you're feeling generous and you just had some wine over lunch. So we all kind of have like an innate kind of 
a feeling about how like what a good pull request feels like. Um, I'm now going to do something that I tell you not to do, which is um, let me show you one my own. Uh, if the internet will allow me. Um, so uh, this really kind of I want to illustrate my ultimate point with this pull request. Um, my initial message, which I'm not going to bother reading it out, going to the detail, is not great. Like even my own approach to this pull request is probably a five out of ten. But at least I. At least I try and make it clear as to what I'm getting up to. But what's important here is what happens after this. So I, I make a little message to say, in addition to what I've said in the title, I'm actually bringing in some additional dependencies that weren't here before. Um, I've got some, I ask a question here, otherwise this thing's good to go. Some bot tells me some stuff. A human being does a review and gives me you know, all of this feedback. Um, I push some more commits. I think, thank you very much. I think I'm done here. Um, despite doing satisfying the review, someone puts a big fat do not merge on it. I don't know what I've done to offend them that day. Um, then there's some more questions. Why did you do this? And blah, blah, blah. Right? And then time passes. You'll see this was something happened between whatever, July and March where this pull request just got ignored because of this do not merge. Right? And then eventually someone comes back to me and I do some more stuff and pretty pictures happen and eventually, you know, you know keeps going. And then finally, finally, um, someone says, okay, you've suffered enough, Paul, I'm going to merge this thing, right? It took a, it took a while to, to really get to that stage. Um, the important thing here is that was basically, all, like I said, when I came up with my own uh, description of a pull request, all of the communication about that feature was in one place. There was not something over here on a mailing list. There was not something tucked away over here on IO. Actually, no, there was a bit on Slack, actually. But by and large, anything meaningful, including decisions and why is this happening, all happened inside the pull request. So all of the content related to that feature that I had worked on was all in one place for time immemorial. Let's talk a little bit about PR templating. People always talk about like, you know, meaningful commit messages, but actually, what goes into a meaningful pull request? Um, how do you make this asynchronous form of communication meaningful? Somebody already threw out motivation as a suggestion. Um, if, there, if, you are if it satisfies an issue, you must link to the issue, because then that makes the communication kind of end to end. Um, not just your motivation, because um, that's like, why did you do this thing, but also, what did you do? Um, you know, that was the failure of that first pull request example, right? Was this a bug fix? Was this a new feature? You know, what actually happened inside that pull request? Like make the maintainer's life easy by telling them precisely what problem you were solving. Um, and then any sanitary conditions, like you know, uh, maybe your project has uh, uh, what you have. I mean, certainly inside an organization, you may have something like uh, has the CLA been signed if it's an external contributor, or um, heck, have you written unit tests if you're if you contribute to anything like say. I don't know. I used to work on Plone, if anyone remembers Plone, and Plone had this thing about you have to write all your unit tests in advance. So this is the kind of thing that you might test inside. Um, how do you actually do this in, in practice? So in the real world, I want to talk a little bit about um, you know, how you do this inside an organization and how this actually syncs up your communication. Um, uh, if you're, I'm going to encode it in Scrum because loads of organizations do Scrum, but it doesn't really matter. Um, um, you probably have a meeting where you do planning, right? That's a great time to open up your pull request. So at the time when the team says we're going to do something, you can actually just open up a, a pull request which just has an empty commit inside it. Um, for those of you who don't know that feature of Git, you should learn it. It's very useful. Um, so you can just push an empty commit and get going. Um, and then you, of course, then do the work. Do all of the communication inside that pull request. And if you have... 230 teams, 200 teams, certainly anything more than a handful of teams. Communicating asynchronous like this um, becomes hyper important because your team, of course, has its own agenda and you don't want to be interrupting each other constantly. And um, there's a reason for that, right? And the reason for that is um, it's, it's Conway's law. Um, who has heard of Conway's law? Um, uh, Couple of you. So Conway's law basically says the structure of your the communication patterns inside your application will be symbiotic with the communication structures that actually produce that piece of software. Um, if you have a bunch of uh, autonomous um, uh, teams that are empowered to do their thing and they communicate asynchronously over a bus. Um, then that's how the teams have to communicate as well, by necessity. If you try and do anything else, if you try and enforce 
real-time communication in an environment where the teams are working asynchronously. Um, it just gets messy. And using pull requests like this um, is a great way of uh, solving this problem. And it's something that we're currently working on inside Zalando. So these pillars of, of mastery and of autonomy and um, the other one that I've just forgotten, um, what they're missing is alignment and an asynchronous form of alignment. And um, the punchline to all of this is really that is what you can use pull requests for. And to go back to my original point about naming, the problem is that they probably should have called them peer review and not pull request. Um, last but not least, a few details on me. I hope you've enjoyed this. Please do, um, people always ask about this. You can just email me. Please go ahead or hit me up on Twitter. Um, I'm always happy to answer questions. Thank you very much. There's a question? Oh yeah, there's a question at the back somewhere. Who is the, who's the? Oh yeah. Yeah, um, shoot. So when you said you can just push an empty commit and start discussing the, uh, about the proposed change or yep. the, uh, the pull request, it, it seems to me like you want us to use pull requests where I think most people would uh, post an issue. Like, I would post an issue if I have no code, but I have an idea. Yeah. I would say maybe we need this, but the pull request for me is like, I got this change, this actual code that I'm going to do. Okay, so I'm, um, so the, for, for those who didn't hear, so the question there was like, it sounds like I'm trying to use pull requests where issues would get used. Um, I'm going to answer that very, very briefly. Let's talk afterwards for more in depth. Um, issues are great for, for user stories, right? So this is a description of, of it's a, a, a customer's problem, right? Um, but what user stories are not good for are for the technical details of the implementation, which is why I say you should map your pull request back to an issue, right? So you work with your product specialist, your product owner, to develop a user story which is very product focused. Um, but then when the team gets together and then actually starts to plan how do we implement this thing, you have a more technical discussion. It's not product focused, it's, it's engineering focused. Um, and that's a good point where you actually open up a pull request which links back to the issue. So now I have my issue as a product related statement and my pull request is a very technical conversation. That's the distinction I like to make. I do not have time for your question, uh, but you can come and grab me afterwards. Yes, Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, that's not a problem.